I'm Travis Brown, founder and CEO of Mojo Up Marketing and Media. And this is my podcast, where I talk to the most successful black and brown business executives who've broken through the barriers of today's business culture. Welcome to Mojo Up Live, the diverse and talented podcast. I'm your host, Travis Brown, and I'm excited to have Fred Payne with me from the United Way of Central Indiana. He's a president and CEO, and he's making difference right here in our community. Fred, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I want to start off talking about, I recently saw your uh, MLK speech uh, at Christmas Addicts for IPS, and you were talking about the audit of MLK's I have a dream. I just want to share because I thought it was so powerful to see that. I'd love for you just to kind of to kind of share the, the highlight of why you chose that and and how are we doing with the dream? Okay. Well, first off, it was always um, exciting for me to go to Christmas Addicts because of the history of the institution, and to be there and to talk about Martin Luther King was really it was really an honor for me. Mm-hmm. When I think about the information that I shared. I really wanted to do sort of a reflection on his dream. We hear about his dream quite a bit, and quite honestly, it's probably one of the most quoted speeches mm-hmm. in the past 60, 50, 60 years. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of go through and see how we're doing. Mm-hmm. And so, so I went So how through. are we doing? <laughs> so how are we doing? It depends. In different areas of the dream, we can put a check next to it. Yeah. that we've made a lot of progress and we can see the essence of parts of that dream. Yeah. Areas where different races are sitting down together, having conversations and actually solving problems. Mm-hmm. We can put a check next to that. But when it comes to the area of us really being judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin, we still have a bit of work to do. Sure. Because all too often, you know, some of the stereotypes that people have and think they end up becoming sort of mental barriers to people. Yeah. And so we still have to get over that hump. Mm. So when I think about his dream and how we've done, some areas we can put a check, dreams mm. came true. Mm-hmm. Some other areas we really have quite a bit of work mm. to do. Mm. And some of that's played out in our communities too with uh, yeah. some systemic things that a lot of organizations throughout Central Indiana are working on. So let's talk about your role at the United Way because it's a you have a big job and a big responsibility based upon who you guys touch. But you know I think people often hear United Way, but maybe not really understand the depth of the things that you guys you know, do. So I'd love for you to kind of frame a um, little little bit first about the United Way and all the things you guys are touching, okay. and then I will come back and hit you on some of the things in your role. Okay. So United Way, we are really a community asset that's built to drive impact uh, in the Central Indiana community. Our particular United Way is about 105 years old. Mm -hmm. And we started off as an organization really um, put put in place to really help community through crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the late 1800s when uh, the uh, TB crisis hit in Colorado, the community got together, put money together to help individuals in the community because that community um, wasn't well equipped to handle the onslaught of the need. And so that was kind of the genesis of this movement in having organizations to really um, have investments from members in the community mm-hmm. and then reinvest it in the community to help people. Right. So within Central Indiana now, our organization covers about six counties. Mm-hmm. And in those six counties, we are really uh, in place to impact poverty. We want to ensure that every individual in those communities can live the lives that they're capable of living. And we do that by removing barriers. Mm. And we remove barriers by helping, by uh, working with our community partners, not-for-profit organizations that are in the community Mm -hmm. that are doing specific work. Um, Organizations that are there to do things like help people to stay afloat uh, in our basic needs area, to help them Mm -hmm. to have a sustainable day-to-day living. Sometimes an individual may need uh, a little assistance on transportation. So we partner with organizations that help that. Sometimes individuals need to uh, keep their lights on. 
But then when we move to the economic mobility portion of helping individuals, we have what we call our two gen, our two generation approach, which we are working with entire families to move them out of poverty. Uh -huh. And that's a variety of things, um, financial stability, uh, getting a uh, high school education certification, things like that, that we know that will help people move to their uh -huh. next level. So we're working with partners in the community to do yeah. those things. With so much need in our, in our communities now, um, and I don't know if that's more or less than, than, than historically it's been, but, but do you ever get to the point where you're like, man, we just can't do enough? Well, I'll put it like this. We can always do more. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to poverty, it's kind of like whack-a-mole. Uh, <laughs> we end up uh, helping out on one issue, but then something else happens, mm -hmm. and then we end up making sure that uh, we don't have a person to slip back. Sure. Because we have about 220,000 people in the central Indiana area, and those people are in that particular population. They are one um, a major event from poverty, right. one car problem away from poverty, one medical incident away from poverty. And we're really trying to assist those individuals to have a sustainable living and to actually um, move their way up uh, the economic ladder so that, um, that they can have a sustainable life. Yeah. I know so it's just one of those things that when I think, of, when I think about your, your, your job with the United Way does, it just feels just so massive to think about all the organizations that you're touching, all the pe people you're touching. So in your role as a president and CEO, you know, what does that look like for you day to day? What's, what's, what's your focus? You know, what's, what's, what's the key to your role? Yeah. Well, a uh, part of it is uh, making sure that we have a good strategic direction to do the things that we need to do in the mm -hmm. community. Uh, I've been in this role for about six months now. And when I came into the role, I picked back up a strategic plan uh, that my predecessor had uh, started. And we've moved that uh, closer to the finish line. Uh, we got some things approved from our board uh, in late December. And part of it is ensuring that we have uh, continued impact on our community and that we're continuing to evolve with the environment. Uh, we know that in 2020, when COVID hit, our community saw a need like they hadn't seen a need before. And United Way was there uh, to help. Mm -hmm. And we're still seeing some impact or some effects of COVID. Mm -hmm. So we want to ensure that we have evolved in a way that's meeting individuals where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and we put a few things in place in 2020 to help. We know that there was a learning loss with our students yeah. during that time period. So we partnered with another organization to make sure that we had something in place to address that need for students, uh, grades one through nine with our Indie Summer Learning Labs. And with that particular uh, initiative, we ended up seeing individuals who were a part of the program, seeing 24, 25% uh, gains hmm. in English and in math. Yeah. Um, let's go back a little bit. I wanna uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, look at your journey because sure. it's funny because so many people see people like yourself that have a job like this, a position like this, and it's like you just showed up yesterday and you just got here, right? But there's a journey and there's a there's a process and probably adversity. So, so uh, take me back from from uh, where'd you go to high school, college? What was that first tough job out of college? So I I grew up in Louisiana. I went to undergrad at Grambling State University. Right. Actually, that's where I grew up. So I went I attended college down the street from where <laughs> where I grew up. Majored in political science. Then I went to grad school in Iowa, and then I went to law school in IU Bloomington. Okay, hold on. Let's, let's pause right there because from Grand, I, I'm just get, I'm seeing it in my head going from Grambling to wherever you went to Iowa had to be a culture change. Very much a culture change. <laughs> I, I'll tell I tell you a funny story about the culture change. So when I went to Iowa, the the thickest jacket that I had was a leather jacket with no lining. That was the thickest jacket I had. Okay, so I'm in Iowa. The day after Halloween. There was an ice storm. Mm. The day after that, snow came down. And I had this basement level apartment. So the window was at ground level. So when the snow came, I looked out the window. It was ground level. Yeah. And I saw all the snow. I started thinking, oh, well, I guess I'm staying in today. <laughs> and then it hit me. Like, hey, wait a minute. This is normal here. Right. I have to get up. 
And at that point, I had the leather jacket. And I had, at the time, a rear-wheel drive car. And if you know how rear-wheel drives check. go... You got, it, some, you, got some, you got strikes against you You got now. some strikes. <laughs> so I bought my first downfield coat mm. that day. And I went to the parking lot at a local mall. And I drove, because I'd never driven on ice or snow before. And so I drove around to try to really get my feeling. And I, I never really did. Yeah. But at least, you know, I felt somewhat comfortable getting on the road. Yeah. So that was a big shock. That weather. Yeah. You go it's from the, it, Louisiana weather to Iowa weather. It's a big that, shock. That's it's, no joke. <laughs> it's a culture when shock. When I was in college, I was, I was at Purdue. And, and we'd have guys on a, on a football team that would come from Florida. And these were, you know, they would call them the Florida boys. And, and they would come, and, and as soon as that winter hit, they were like, I don't want to go to class. I don't want to walk anywhere. I don't want to go anywhere. Yeah. We're like, no, this is just part of it. So Yeah, it's, uh, yeah that, was, that was a big culture shock. <laughs> so, all right, so from Iowa to then, you go to IU Law, right? I went to IU Law. Um, I say that with a sigh a little bit because you just, you know, I'm a Purdue guy. So just I, any of that IU stuff just kind of just, mm. Well, I, I know you want, you're actually saying that you really wish you had gone there. <laughs> I know that's the look that you have on your face, but I'm going to let that go. Okay, okay. Well, actually, the interesting thing was um, when I was looking for law schools, my intent was to return to Louisiana. Mm. So, which meant IU was really not high on the list, right? Great academics, but in terms of what I wanted to do, return to Louisiana, um, being in school in the South, was more in line with what I wanted to do. Here's the change. I visited the law school. They had a spring law day. I attended spring law day. And midway through that day, I made up my mind. Really? I, it felt right. Hmm. It felt comfortable. Um, there's no science to it. It was a feeling. Wow. And I, I made up my mind that day and said, this is where I'm going to go because it just felt right. And did your family at back home like why you, you you went from here to Iowa and now Indiana? <laughs> it's uh so at the time just to get into a little bit of my own personal journey at the time uh, I was also married, so I was married at the end of my junior year in college, mm -hmm. and my then wife um, she grew up in Louisiana as well, and she was she had received a full scholarship to a law school at Iowa. So we wore a package, so we okay. went there together. Makes sense. So that's how Got to Iowa, we right. ended up in Iowa. Okay. And as things went, we <clears throat> were trying to look for things, you know, to be in the Midwest. But I did end up getting a divorce my first year in law school. And that was where some things started to change for me mm -hmm. uh, emotionally. My, actually my first, my first law school exam that I took was the day that my divorce was final. Mm -hmm. So it was a very emotional time. Mm -hmm. um, and quite honestly, I, um, I really thought that I wasn't gonna make it through law school because mm -hmm. of that emotion. But as things go, that was the best semester I had in law school in terms of grades. Wow. Um, I remember calling my dad after one of my finals, it was a torts final. And for those of you who know anything about law school, torts is five credit hours. You mess up on torts, you pretty much messed up on everything else. Hmm. So I remember taking my torts final, but I don't remember writing anything now hmm. because my mind wasn't there. Went to my apartment that night and I called my dad and I told him how I was feeling. And I told him how, um, you know, dad, I, I don't, I don't really think that I did well. I actually don't even remember if I wrote anything down. Hmm. And my dad, he since passed away, but my dad being the guy that he was, he wasn't having any part of that pity party. <laughs> so he said, well, son, you're hurt right now, but you're not dumb. I want you to sulk tonight and get up in the morning and do what you need to do. And I looked at the phone, you know, that's a pity party. That's not, you're, you're not, you're not being a part of this pity party. My response to him was, yes, sir. Mm. Hung up the phone, did exactly what he told me to do. And the rest of my week was pretty much like that. Mm. And then the next semester realized I had some of the, I did, um, I did really well on those exams. Um, 
and ultimately it became really my first, my the best semester that I had in law school in terms of grades. You know, I, I've had uh, several other uh, attorneys, you know, on the show and talking about law school. You know, obviously, I've, I've not been through law school, um, but but is it is it is it just that hard? It's the enormity of the reading is the thing that is most challenging. Mm. When it comes to subject matters, there are some subject matters that are harder than others. Right? Yeah. They're more difficult than others. But it's really the enormity of the reading mm. and really developing your own cadence of reading and how you learn and how you digest material um, and whether or not you want to outline everything you've read, whether or not you mm. want to highlight your book and use that as your reference point. But that's where the difficulty lies mm. is in the enormity of the reading and really having mm. good time management skills. I know you went on to uh, to serve as general counsel in a couple of scenarios, but then you ended up at Honda. I was just curious, you know. So what did what did Honda that experience that big corporate, you know? Uh, I always think of Honda as efficiency and you know make these great products. But what did you learn at, at Honda as a as a as a leader? Honda was Honda was a totally different experience for me because before I went into Honda, I was a, I was an attorney representing you know a multitude of clients in employment and labor. Mm. When I went to Honda. Um, it was a startup in Indiana. You recall back then, there was no Honda in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And when I say startup, I'm talking about the purchase of 1,700 acres of land. We worked out of the old Kmart building that was in Greensburg uh, wow. to train. And many of us worked in trailers because the building, that facility was being built. Hmm. wasn't built at the time. So going through that, um, and really seeing it grow from essentially ground up until the first car rolled off the line uh, back in 2008, I uh, started learning a lot about different things that were actually mm. outside of the law sphere. Mm. Even though that was why I was there to help start the legal division, mm. uh, my experience uh, in other areas started to grow in corporate affairs, engaging with local leaders in the community, mm -hmm. um, so I became uh, a person who, I was really a fixture in Greensburg. It became sort of my second home because I spent just as much time there as I spent you know, back home with you know, my wife and kids. And I experienced a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, I started experiencing and having to oversee a variety of areas uh, such as administration, which housed human resources, comp benefits, um, corporate planning mm. side of the house, IT, all of the things that made the organization work with manufacturing. So everything outside of manufacturing on the business side, those were things that I started to oversee in the organization. And it started allowing me to see things from sort of a bigger point mm. of view, not just legal. Yeah. When you're a lawyer and you're making a legal decision, it's one thing. <laughs> but when you're in an organization making a business decision, you build mm. in the legal decision mm. and you calculate those business risks mm. based upon the information that you receive from legal and yep. the information that you receive from other sources of the organization. And I'm curious to know now in your role, now it's not just legal and business, but, but but you're in the business of making people decisions. Right. You know, how does that, tra how does that been, tra how does that transfer going from that mindset? Because it still is business. It is, you're still a business, sure. but, but there's that, there's a different level. It feels like maybe a different level of people that in your decision-making process than maybe before, maybe not. I'm just curious. You know, when you think about it, a lot of the, the analysis is, is the same in terms of taking in as much data as you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking at what's fair and looking at what outcomes you want to achieve. And so when you take it from that standpoint and looking at all the data points that you need to make a good decision and making sure that you have good people around you who are going to provide you all of the advice that you need to make a decision, mm -hmm. transfer that to a different arena. The same playbook is there. Good information in, good information out. Mm -hmm. Bad information in, bad information out, bad outcomes. So I've always tried to make sure that 
I have tried to ask the right questions, that I have the right data, but also have the right people around me who um, are, they're invested in the work, mm -hmm. in the outcome, they care about the work and they care about other people. And when you have those type of people around you, you're gonna make some good decisions. They're gonna, yeah. they're gonna force you to make good decisions because when you come up with something that isn't so good, mm -hmm. they're gonna let you know. Right. And that's what I've always wanted. I always want people around me who are gonna tell me, hey, that's a good mm -hmm. idea, but uh -huh. you need to do this. What if we did this? Yeah. What if we did this um, at this time instead of three months later? Will we get a better outcome? Posing those types of questions um, allow us to end up having better outcomes mm -hmm. regardless of the environment you're in. Mm -hmm. So with that leadership style, do you, you know, obviously you've been, you've been crafted, molded, influenced by your legal perspective and what you had to do um, at, at Honda. You know, so how would you categorize your leadership style now um, at the United Way? I am, you know, I do lead by consensus because I do want to make sure that uh, I've got input from people around me. And that really, I can say, it took shape and took hold more at Honda than it did uh, previous. Mm -hmm. When I came into Honda, when you're a lawyer, you have your mindset, this is the way we're going to go, and we're moving in that direction. But when you become a part of a team, you have to think a little bit differently because it's not really yeah. about that singular thing. <laughs> you're not right. a surgeon anymore. You're a general practitioner. Mm -hmm. So now I take all of that into account, and I try to make sure that the people around me are brought along with the decisions Mm -hmm. uh, that we make together. Now, mind you, there are some decisions in the role that I've been and in with other people who are in similar roles. There are some decisions that you have to make on your own. Sure. And that uh, regardless of what people around you are, are saying, you have a vision and you just know. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to be foolhardy about it. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you're taking into consideration all of the information and then really come to a consensus. Mm -hmm. And if you come to a consensus, I think you, you end up having uh, more people who can, um, you know, they can, you know, lift up the voice for you. Mm -hmm. You're not the only voice piece that's out there. Yeah. And just imagine how much further you can go if you have a team of people who are rowing in the same direction as you. So I'm curious, you know, you're, you're married and, ki you have, and you have kids. Um, so how does your leadership style differ at home <laughs> than it, as it does at work. Well, uh, let me tell you, tell you about that. When you, it, so, I, have, I still have two teenage kids at home, so that should tell you enough <laughs> about how the leadership style goes. Well, one, they know everything, okay, and I mean that in a in a good way. In a world of technology, my children teach me so much. Hmm. Uh, and when I think about leadership styles, sometimes you have to step back and allow yourself to be taught by other people. So at home, I'm taught a lot by my children. My children teach me a lot about myself. They push me. Um, when my son was six, he wanted to start playing hockey. I never played hockey. I grew up in Louisiana. It wasn't a thing. <laughs> but over the next few years, until he was in the eighth, ninth grade, we became hockey people. Hmm. And I learned that. And I was engaged with... Um, different parents because at that time uh, when you're on sort of the travel circuit with yeah. travel sports hockey basketball and even sometimes football you start engaging with parents and then you start developing relationships right but for those experiences on the court on the ice or on the field you wouldn't have met some of those people absolutely so my children have pushed me in areas and relationships mm -hmm. They have pushed me in areas of technology and even stepping back and sometimes questioning, you know what? Ten years ago as a parent, I saw it a certain way. And now 100%. the conversations with my children, yeah. they're changing how I look at things. And that really, you know, transfers over to work mm -hmm. because I have to look at things through a diff different lens every day. My children are the ones who really help me do that. No, I, I think that's so so true. I have, I have a big. She's at um, um, at Purdue, and then I have two littles that are seven and, and, and nine, ten, uh, and so even that gap in you know 
from when I raised the first one to, to these two, just my pers- perspective on, you know, raising kids and leadership and discipline and, you know, the world, right? You know, my son, I say something to him, I ask him a question, he's like, Alexa, you know, and we'll ask Alexa <laughs> a question or go walk to your phone and ask Siri a question, you know, on your iPhone. Like just the, the way that things evolve so fast, which it really challenges leadership. And, you know, um, I wonder for you, like what has been uh, kind of one of those things that you just has been the hard lesson that you've had to learn in leadership. And I, I, I lead a lot because of failure, <clears throat> I fail, learn, lead. I'm just kind of interested to hear what that might be for you. Really is that, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, it's really when you take when you realize something is not working mm-hmm. and you spend a lot of time developing something and then you have to pivot what I learned was not don't be afraid to pivot real fast mm. because if it's not working and you and you've done everything that you can it's not going to change <laughs> if you just keep putting in mm-hmm. more effort um so what I learned, and I learned it the hard way, was that I have to be willing to pivot pretty quickly when things aren't going the way that they should be going. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that when something starts off, if it's not succeeding the way that you want, it doesn't mean that it's wrong mm-hmm. uh, because it may not be mature enough yet, right? But there are times when the data continues to come back and it's not changing. Mm-hmm. There's no trend line that's <laughs> right. moving up, right? Right. And so you have to be able to pivot really quickly. And I think back in, and I, I won't go into, I can't go into details about the specifics, but really when I was at Honda in, in 2010, um, we had put together um, you know, this, this initiative that we thought was gonna be great, or I thought was gonna be great. And we started rolling it out. And almost immediately we realized that it just wasn't, it wasn't as great as we thought. Mm. And the person I reported to at the time and I, we, we talked about it and we said we need to pivot. We didn't want to pivot. But then we got a good team around us and said, how do we pivot really quickly? And how do we come up with a new concept that's going to be good for our employees and that's going to be good for the community? And we did that pretty quickly. And that taught me then not to be afraid of the pivot. And so now, the things that I, I like to do, you know, when I'm thinking about leading, I do a few things. One, I engage. Uh-huh. I engage with the, what I believe is the right group of people to get the task done, what needs to be done. The second is, you know, I apply what I learn from the engagement. Mm. And then the third thing is I review and reflect. And when I review and reflect, I have to make sure that I do that frequently and I do it early. We've all had projects where we had a goal in mind and the goal is like 18 months out. And we're charging toward that goal, but we don't reflect. Mm. Now we can get into that 18 month goal, in two months we realize it isn't working well, and then we need to make a quick pivot, not completely turn around, we need to tweak some things. It's easier to tweak something two months in than it is 12 months in. Right. So I take those three Reflection. principles with me. I like you know, that. Engage, apply the education piece, and piece of them reflect. Reflect, I like that. All right, I gotta put you on the hot seat. So sure. this is Mojo up hot seat. I got a list of questions. Your, these are your favorites. Uh, one word or phrase answer, first thing that comes to mind. Uh, favorite place to vacation? Uh, Louisiana. Uh, coolest city you've ever been to? Seattle. Uh, favorite homemade meal? Oh, apple pie. Yeah, well, it's not a homemade meal, but it's my favorite thing. It's there you go. Something made uh, favorite restaurant to eat at? Um, well, I don't know if I really have a f- favorite restaurant that, that one of your favorites. Eat at. Okay, well, Brew Link. Okay. Uh, a, a favorite brand? Nike. Uh, favorite f- sports team? Oh, the Bulls. A favorite all, all-time favorite athlete. Michael Jordan. When she said the Bulls, I knew that was coming next. <laughs> uh, uh, favorite college? Grandma State University. Um, one of the last TV shows you've binged watched? Oh, 
Uh, I binged watched uh, The Recruit on Netflix with my daughters over the Christmas holiday. Somebody else just said that the other day. I got to watch that now. Um, a movie that was been impactful in your life. Um, movie that was impactful. Or one that you think everybody needs to watch. <laughs> Jerry Maguire. <laughs> yes. Uh, favorite type of music? Uh, all genres, but I love R&B. Uh, a hype song? Uh, right now, you know what? My, my hype song right now that I was listening to on my way over here is Rolling in the Deep by Dale. Okay. But it's the James X version. <laughs> I've heard that one. Uh, my last question always, what nonprofits, what nonprofit do you love to support? But I got to imagine, you know, this is an easy one for sure. you. Oh, United Way, of course. <laughs> and all the partners that you guys yeah. have. Um, last question is this, is that there'll come a point in time in your life, as all of ours, where uh, there's a number, a dash, and a number on a tombstone, and a mm -hmm. bunch of people are going to talk about you. What do you want them to say about you? Um, that, you know, at the end of the day that I was fair and that, you know what, I made people feel like they mattered. Mm. I think that's awesome. I, I really appreciate you sitting down and uh, sharing this. That, that time goes quick, so it does. you get to, uh, to do the official It's a Wrap. It's a wrap.